a real pleasure to be part of the Heterodox Academy. I've admired the work for a long time and was delighted to, to join. Yes, we, we are in, in, in polarized times. It is not easy to have civil conversations and a good bit of my work at the Institute certainly is supporting those on the front lines who we need to have those courageous conversations. So it's it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. So subject of today's discussion is, 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 is why knowledge is a dirty word. Of course, that's rhetorical. But let me tell you what I'm talking about. Have you ever heard someone say that learning how to learn is more important than learning something in particular? Learning how to learn, the process, is more important than the content. Or you know, kids don't really need to remember the state capitals or when the Civil War ended, or they don't really need to remember who wrote things fall apart because they can just Google it. Or how about this one? What we know is changing so fast that we don't want to make kids learn something that may be irrelevant in 20 years. So 21st century skills like critical thinking, comparative, contrasting, all of those things, that's what we need to focus on. Those are the kinds of buzzwords and slogans that I'm talking about that comprise the end result of a hundred year process that sets knowledge and skills against one another. And why that's a problem and why the prioritizing of skills over content is not good for the United States, particularly for our first generation and low income families. That's the subject of today's conversation. So in the next half hour, we're going to be talking about what happened in education and why, why it's problematic and what we can do about it. So Samantha and I were talking earlier about how dire the world can seem right now, but there is hope. There are really courageous leaders out there who are prioritizing knowledge for the benefit of their students. So first, what happened? Now, my doctorate's in history, and I spent a lot of time studying this, but the best expert on the history of American education, in my mind, is Diane Ravitch, who's usually, she and I disagree on most everything, but she is excellent on the, what happened to the academic curriculum. Her book, Left back is in the bibliography that I've provided for, for you all, for anyone who wants it. And, and in her words, the history of American education is essentially the attack on the academic curriculum. Now, what does she mean by the academic curriculum? And this is again, Ravitch, quote, the academic curriculum refers to the systematic study of language, literature, science, mathematics, history, the arts, foreign languages, these studies that are commonly described today as, quote, liberal education, they convey both knowledge and skills, they cultivate imagination, and they teach students to think critically and reflectively about the world in which they live. So the liberal arts curriculum, um, where did we start with the liberal arts curriculum? Well, in the, in the late 18th and early 19th century, modern governments started to expand the right to vote. And with expanding the right to vote, they expanded publicly funded education. I just want to pause for a minute and note that we cannot forget that in our country during this time, only a very small percentage of the population was able to access education. There were people who were forbidden to access education. So I don't want to forget that tragic blot against the United States. Let's just hold that for a moment. But the education policy debates were, so what are we going to teach? If we're expanding democratic education, what is the stuff that kids should be learning? And uniformly, the answer was the liberal arts curriculum. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, in our country, the members of parliament, and in the UK, the government of the Netherlands, it was in the kingdom of the Netherlands, massive agreement across the nascent democracies that the liberal arts curriculum was the access to democratic formation and also to social opportunity. This is exactly what Thomas Jefferson emphasized and there are quotes after quote after quote of him emphasizing this point. So becoming a teacher in those early years meant exit exams, Graduating from high school meant passing content-specific exams in all of these major subjects. 
demonstrating competence and then going to a normal school. It was called a normal school then, not a school of education and deepening your content knowledge. Why? Because you had to know where a subject was going in order to back map it all the way down to the, the kids level. And so that was the norm across Europe and so forth through the 19th century in our country. And it was, it was, it's interesting that it was the same in the democratic countries and it was also the same in the United States in farming communities in cities in the small towns. There was variety of kinds of schools that were funded, but the curriculum was relatively similar and here's what ravages book says is exemplary of the um, the academic curriculum. This is a farming communities high school in Nineveh, Indiana in 1900. In Nineveh, Indiana, of the high school's 22 pupils, 22 pupils, half of them commuted from outlying farms. The curriculum consisted of Latin, maths, English, literature, history, geology, physics, rhetoric, civil government. This was not atypical. Every high school worthy of its name offered Latin and mathematics and foreign languages. That's page 26 in her book, Left Back. If the elites have it, everyone should have it. This was part of a massive popular education movement. It led to libraries, to quote, working men's associations, settlement houses, that you've got to give access. I can provide so many examples from history of how transformative it was for um, social mobility and for equal access. Now, I'm not saying, <laughs> that um, this was perfect, as we know it was not in many ways. And I'm not saying that the ideal is to have a fixed, rigid body of knowledge, that the canon is where it's at. There is ample evidence that kids need access to traditional thought and also to newer voices, to cultural representation, and the best curricula do that. So I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying we should all just grab off the shelf the Western canon and say, here you go, kids, this is it. It needs, it's much more nuanced and complicated and exciting than that. But anyway, to recap, we started with democratizing the liberal arts, and most high-performing school systems still do. Most still do study the curriculum of the highest performing countries and systems, and that's exactly what they do. Now, something happened in the early 20th century that pushed against knowledge. It happened, this is more than 100 years ago, remember. And a new movement, largely lived in the schools of education, claimed that education should be about skills and process and learning how to learn and learning by doing and was actually had great animus against the liberal arts curriculum. And there were many, many different reasons for this. And Diane Ravitch and Edie Hirsch chronicle it. There's lots of sources I put in the bibliography, but the bottom line is by the 1920s, the skills movement had won. I mean, there were ideological battles at Columbia Teachers College. I mean, these things were real. They influenced people's lives and they spread out across the country. And there were many well-meaning aspects of this. Um, I can give examples of that. There were also some quite troubling aspects of this. For example, Herbert Spencer was one of the most popular writers um, in England. He was famous in the United States. He popularized the term survival of the fittest based on a Darwinian application into society. And he really believed that education should be about helping kids find where their place was in society. And you know, this was the early eugenics movement that some kids could not have. They could not get this educational level. They shouldn't, they couldn't grasp it. There was early psychologists like G. Stanley Hall, many, many examples of people who were condescending or downright racist. And of course, there was, again, there was this other side that said, well, education should be about child development. There was a Freudian emphasis in the 20s and 30s. But in any case, the bottom line was that skills over content. And we have that legacy today. We have that legacy today. We are often told as though it were something new, 21st century skills. That's what kids need. Forget about knowledge. It's oppressive. 
I'm just going to summarize this research. There's a massive body of research out there. I'm talking here about Dan Willingham at UVA. I'm talking about E.D. Hirsch again, also at UVA. But there's lots and lots of evidence. Read Natalie Wexler's book, The Knowledge Gap. So the point is, the research is from around the world. Background knowledge matters. The amount of knowledge that you bring to the classroom has a profound impact on what you can learn in the classroom. And of course, this is an equity issue that kids need to have high quality content rich curricula. This is where Dan Willingham talks about the stickiness of knowledge, that the more you know, the more you can know. Again, this is a, an SES equity issue that you know, kids need to have a systematic, sequenced, spiraled approach to their learning in the classroom. That is our responsibility as teachers. Um, I've been a classroom teacher, so I've had to do this work, even it's hardest at the little tiny bitty level, but they also need, kids also need, uh, the research is clear on this as well, a culturally representative sources. They need both, and Dr. Santalisi's in Baltimore City calls it the mirrors and windows approach. Um, oops, I meant to go. And it needs to be cumulative. So if you look at a really good course of study, it's year on year that sequences and spirals back to the same knowledge. And, and this is critical, multiple perspectives. That is one of the things the Institute tests for when we evaluate curricula and ELA and social studies. I should also say that the content, the knowledge versus skills really comes to the fore when it comes to ELA, English language arts and social studies, less so in math because in math the content and the skills are so so similar. You demonstrate knowledge about by doing X, but in English language arts in particular there's a vast difference between a content rich curriculum and one that is not. Now, let me give you an example of what this looks like. This is real world. What does it actually look like to be in a skills focused English language arts classroom versus a knowledge rich language in ELA classroom? What does it actually look like and feel like? Actually, I'm going to I'm going to come back to, to ELA in a minute. This is on social studies. So uh, this is actually from a real, a real district. Um, their eighth graders were studying the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I just wanna call up the first two paragraphs of that. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the, I can't see the word, equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of justice, freedom, and peace in the world. Oops. I'm terrible at this. And whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts, which have outraged the conscious, conscience of mankind. All right, this is an amazing document. It is actually the most translated document in world history. And here's what a skills-based te a teacher who's been taught about skills and skills only is going to, to, to do with this. Find the main idea about the first paragraph. What's the main idea of the first paragraph? What is the word barbarous? What does that mean in the second paragraph? So it's a very, very narrow look at a rich document. Now I do wanna say, and I will say this again and again, skills are necessary. The skills of comparative contrast and finding the main idea, finding evidence, these I'm not demeaning the skills themselves, but they should be learned in the, in the process of knowledge building activities and experiences and encounters. So the skills-based classroom is gonna focus very narrowly on find the main idea and, and um, vocabulary words. A, a knowledge rich classroom is gonna be very different. It's going to say to the kids, you know, let's read this out loud. Let's think about this. Let's figure out what we understand and don't understand vocabulary wise. But the big question is this, when was this written? Oh, it was written in 1948 and adopted in 1948 by the United Nations. Let's just ask this question. Why, why is it important to declare universal human rights? Well, who argues against human rights? Doesn't it seem like a no-brainer? Who argues against that? Oh, what had just happened? You remember, you studied the Second World War. What had just happened? What was happening in the gulags? 
you know, unpacking it, giving, helping kids develop an emotional attachment to this document, but moreover, the deeper questions about what it means to be human and what the just society looks like. It's a wonderful opportunity as well to add, um, you know, the, the, the tragic irony that the United States um, voted in favor of this document, and yet you can say to your students, what was happening in our country in 1948? What could we have interrogated about our own relationships within our communities at that time? Those are the kinds of things. And, and, and so the document is layered upon background knowledge that you can remind the kids about, and it can catapult you to additional questions and things that you will revisit when you're studying um, the 1960s Civil Rights Act. So those are the kinds of through lines that you want to be doing. And if you're not doing that, you're missing an opportunity in the classroom. And we see this again and again and again. And I'm just gonna put this in very real world, real world terms. These are the recent NAPES. And this is, this is what happens when, as Natalie Wexler says, the, not, the, the achievement gap is a knowledge gap Look at this. This is proficiency on our NAEP scores. Now, I don't think everything's about assessments. Please don't get me wrong. But that only 20% of our high school students, 20% are proficient in geography. Proficiency is a low bar. 12% in US history. These are the sober consequences of forsaking a, a really rigorous shared content-rich curriculum. So the question is, what do we do about it? And this is the hopeful part. And I'm gonna to try to talk fast here because I'm trying to leave ample time for questions. But I think there's a three-step process to reviving the conversation. There's a three-step process. The first is actually seeing it, recognizing it. And in my experience, the, 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 the best way to actually recognize it and see it is by experience. It is by ex looking at at the curricula that they use in the UK and saying, whoa, this is what every kid gets in the, in the UK? Um, wow, or this is what a really high performing school system in the States is doing, or this is this curriculum. You can pull back and look at how entire systems work, or you can actually look and you can visit classrooms where this is going on and see how children are enlivened and see what the results are for them and their families and their parents. Now, another thing that you can do, which we, we do at the Institute, is to actually study the difference between curricula. And, and again, this is this, the sober reality is that there's a vast difference between an ELA or a social studies curriculum that may be standards aligned and one that is standards aligned, which is of course necessary standards aligned, but also content rich. There's a real difference. So I'm gonna slow down for a minute. I'm gonna show you the inside of the, in, the Johns Hopkins Institute's knowledge mapping process. I'm happy to talk about this offline with anyone who wants to, but our knowledge map is a way of, of analyzing a K-12 curriculum. We do it in ELA and social studies, and we look at every text or photograph or piece of art that students encounter. And the questions that we ask, we have a quality rubric. We also have, um, and this is our social studies rubric. These are the kinds of questions that we ask. Does this curriculum prioritize content knowledge? Does it do so intentionally and sequentially? In other words, do we see the same topics coming up again and again, year after year, or every three years or every four years, it's something like that. Are, they, are the sources culturally representative and also rigorous? That is one thing we've seen in many, many partnerships that we've had where the culturally re representative texts you know, they're, they're missing opportunities to pull really the best of the best that are also representative. Um, and we, we do that kind of work all the time and that they provide multiple perspectives. And finally, do the teacher facing instructions support deliberation and debate? And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is an example from real curriculum. This is K to, you can see along the top, it's grade by grade. And these are just two of the topic domains. Obviously we have you know, dozens of topic do of domains and topics, but the darker the box, the more sources there are. So this is what it looks like if there's a content rich approach, and this is when it's not. 
you can see now no curriculum should cover everything but there's a vast difference in one that's doing one thing like social and emotional learning but that's not doing it in tandem with building content knowledge about other things at the unit level this is another thing that often pertains that a uh, an anchor text or a key text may be building students knowledge about five different topics. The question is, are the supplemental texts working alongside of those? Are they building up the content knowledge or are they off in a thousand different directions? The good news is, if you're a teacher, if you're a curriculum lead, if you're a district leader and you see that your, your units are not pulling in the same direction topically, you can do something about it. Um, it, it is, it's just seeing it, it's just seeing it. And then does every single unit in a social studies curriculum, we don't ask this question about ELA, but are there multiple voices? Are there multiple perspectives? And this is a heterodox academy um, a win also. Are there, are there teacher instructions that encourage deliberation and debate? So I'm gonna turn now from social studies to a, an ELA curriculum review. This is one of our most consistent partners has been the Baltimore City Public School System. And um, they actually went through, we went, did a review with them and they ended up adopting wit and wisdom in grades K to eight, which is culturally representative and very high quality, very consistent with the knowledge building. And um, we also spent a year working with them on their ninth through 12th grade ELA. Now, this is the difference. They had wonderful novels, and I'm just going to take one unit from ninth grade, the other Westmore. It is a wonderful story, and their old unit provided supplemental texts that had nothing to do with it. There were things about resiliency, things about a devastating shark attack, police seek pair in killing. You know, there were Maybe you could see a theme, but they weren't speaking to the core of the story. So their, their um, team uh, redesigned this and they, they, they re we all reread the book and said, okay, what do kids need to really understand this text? So in their own place, this is in Baltimore. So we, we brought in Baltimore Sun photographs of the Baltimore riots in 1968, which was a key part of the story. We had articles about the mayor, Kurt Schmoke of Baltimore, who wanted to end the drug war and not criminalize crack cocaine, all these things. And then finally, and this part will still bring me to tears, we put in a piece about the Rhodes Scholarship, a three minute video about the Rhodes Scholarship because Wes Moore was a Rhodes Scholar, Kurt Schmoke was a Rhodes Scholar. This is something Baltimore City kids need to know. So, that's a, but kind of before and after. So actually doing that work, looking closely at the curriculum, diving in and then experiencing the difference is really the first step. And the second step in kind of changing the course, changing the, the way we think about knowledge and re-engaging with this knowledge building proposition is we have to make the case. And we're making the case, it's, it's a countercultural case. And there are many, many, again, many forces against a kind of knowledge rich, culturally responsive um, curriculum and um, habit, cultural habits, that this is not what education's about. So there, are, here's, here's an example of the case we could make. We can make a pragmatic case that a content rich curriculum produces better test scores. Now, actually that's, there was a very interesting study that came out last year from the Thomas B. Fordham Institute showing that analyzing um, assessment data, showing that when kids had more hours with social studies, their ELA on kind of standardized assessments went up. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so the, there's the very pragmatic one. There's a social mobility one. This is Edie Hirsch's argument that if you want to really expand access to social mobility, to economic opportunity, to democratic citizenship, you need to create a common, you, you need to create access to the knowledge that the elite schools have. And so, you know, his, his kind of social mobility argument is everybody needs to be able to read the New York Times op-ed page or pick another one, Wall Street Journal op-ed page, whichever one, without having to Google the references. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what he's going for. You can make the democratic formation argument that we need a shared body of knowledge. And I will tell you that other countries do this well. 
even in highly heterogeneous and pluralistic countries. I'll just give you one example. The Netherlands funds 36 different kinds of schools as part of their public education system. Jewish, Islamic, Montessori, socialist, secular, state delivered, all this stuff, all these different kinds of schools. Guess what? They all have to take the same assessments on content knowledge. They don't have to teach this stuff as truth, but they have to teach it. So there are many nuances to that, but it's a very different approach to knowledge and ethos at the schools. And, and the point is democratic formation. You have to create social cohesion and the way they do this is around a common curriculum or common body of knowledge that's interpreted through different lenses because knowledge is interpreted through different lenses and all knowledge is selected knowledge. Um, but I think the strongest argument again is equity. I think you, you know, you have to make the argument. I mean, they're all important, but the equity argument is goes like this: that well-resourced families provide ample background knowledge about the world, not just traveling, jetting around the world, whatever, but going to museums, reading at night, you know, talking about current events, things like that. Families that are first generation where both parents, neither parent is fluent in the language or, you know, they're working four jobs between two people, they don't have time to do this. And, and, and it's part of our job as educators to provide the background knowledge for every child. And the OECD resources and research suggests that will narrow the achievement gap. We've seen it again and again when we look under the hood of the research. So I feel that this is a profound call to providing um, equity in our excellence, as it were. So those are the making the case. And then finally, how do we act? Well, how do we create action around this? Well, I, it does depend on where you sit. If you're a national leader or if you're a state leader, um, you can, you know, in, you can do certain policies that will incentivize the use of high quality curriculum and assessments and professional development. You can do the innovative assessments. Um, Louisiana has done this. I will tell you that there are two membership organizations that are putting a big bet behind high quality instructional materials. The Council of for Chief State School Officers, which is the national member organization of all the commissioners, and then Chiefs for Change, which has got a lot of reform minded um, um, leaders in, in, in states and districts and, and so forth. And they are supporting their members in looking at their curriculum, doing curriculum audits, really making sure their kids are getting the best and that there's a consistency across a system. And, and so if, you're, if that's where you sit, then those are places to go. Um, if you're a principal, if you're a superintendent, in your adoption process, you can model after some of these successful adoption processes. Duval County, Florida, Detroit, Michigan, Chicago with their international baccalaureate programs. Did you know that when in 1997, Chicago Public Schools put the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, which was thought to be just for rich suburbs they put they put that program for four years the, the ninth 10th 11th and 12th grade years in their lowest performing high schools the kids who went through four years of the ib diploma program even though only 20 percent of them passed the international diploma the D, the U.S. rate of passing is 70 percent, even only 20 percent pass the diploma, they had a 40 percent greater chance of going to college and sticking to college than their matched peers. Now, the IB is a challenging, is challenging, and it requires changes in teacher behavior. It is cost effective if you want to look at it that way, but it is transformational for kids, so much so that Rahm Emanuel, who had mayoral control of Chicago, made scaling up IB a signature of Chicago public schools. Any system can make these kinds of moves. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what Baltimore City did. When they adopted Wit and Wisdom, they knew that teachers needed support and they actually allocated 10 days of professional development per year to the curriculum. That kind of curriculum support, teachers need this. It's really, it's hard enough to be a teacher 
and asking, switching curriculum, trying to be on the same page, it's very difficult. It takes time. So there are lots and lots of examples of courageous systems and school leaders. There are Catholic school systems that have done this, charter schools that really focus on this icon, chart, public prep, I mean, all these examples. Um, so that's what you can do if you're a system leader or a school leader, if you're a teacher, you can find communities of support. And here I want to call out the Carnegie Corporation that has a curriculum based professional kind of professional learning community. Call Barbara Davidson at Standards Works. She works on this. She's there are lots of wonderful places to go and, and write to me if you want to. I'm happy to introduce you to people, but there's hope. There are places to go to join with others who are trying to do this work. Now, I want to close on one thing, which is if you're a parent listening to this, or if you're if you're a teacher or a school leader and you're like, well, you know, content-rich curriculum means there's going to be stuff that people don't agree with in there. I mean, if they're fighting about Ruby Bridges, the story of Ruby Bridges in Tennessee, you know, that's how do you navigate this? Well, I think that's another, you know, their parents need support and, and, and all of us need to be a little better about separating exposure and indoctrination. So exposure to different ideas and it, it doesn't mean you're indoctrinating somebody. And I just want to get back to this notion of shared knowledge, even if you don't have shared beliefs. Most OECD countries require, say, comparative religion and ethics every year, even though they fund Jewish schools, Muslim schools, all these schools get funding, you still have to learn what other people think and believe. And I think those principles are kind of that articulating that, that there's not a threat to exposure per se, although it, there should be in some guardrails. And I put one of my op-eds in the, in, the, in the bibliography that talks about this. This is hard work. It can be done. There are courageous schools and school boards that are putting really robust policies in place about deliberation, debate, and disagreement, and why this is important for democracy. But sadly, that's another conversation. So the whole thing about knowledge, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, that, that knowledge for various reasons focusing on the academic curriculum has been deprioritized in American education for 100 years. That has been a, a, to the detriment of our, our learning and our students, and we can turn that around. So thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me, Samantha and Daniel. I would love to have questions from the audience. Thank, thank you, Ashley. That, that was super informative. As someone who doesn't know too much about all of this and just to, to dive right into it, I, I feel like I learned a lot. So thank you. Um, we have all sorts of questions coming in. So they may be a little bit all over the place content-wise. We'll, we'll do our best to group them. Um, the first one comes from Sam. Uh, who asks, what are your thoughts about study skills, memorization, and testing for acquired knowledge? Ah, okay. It's very, very good. So um, I, I actually think there's some, there's some value to some memorization. Um, you know, things like the multiplication tables. If you, if you watch kids who haven't memorized those, it kind of, it inhibits you longer term. But when I think about what other countries do, and I can just go back to my own experience. My children were in an English school and they did what the high school did in the US that Diane Ravitch talked about, rhetoric and memorizing poetry. They used to have poetry contests and the kids loved it. And you know, my kids can still say, my kids are in their mid twenties, they can still say those poems. Dana Joya, who was the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts for a long time, was a poet. He talks about how his mother, who was an, a, a migrant worker, they, they come from Mexico, and, and how she went to a public school that way back in the 20s was still teaching you to memorize poetry and documents, major documents. She raised him on this. She could remember this when he was a little boy. I think that with, with it, as long as it's part of a bigger whole, as long as it's not memorizing just facts for the sake of it, then that's um, then I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good muscle to have. Now assessments are a different thing. American assessments are are tend to be knowledge agnostic. High performing systems actually create a virtuous circle 
between the, the curriculum, the teacher, the classroom, and then the assessments. And our country hasn't really done that in a very long time, but the federal government has created a pi kind of pilot authority exemption under ESSA that allows states to create innovative assessments. And one of those models in Louisiana, it's been done with Louisiana's guidebooks curriculum and with wit and wisdom, which is you, those two are the most commonly used curricula in Louisiana. And it's like a rolling four stakes assessment that asks kids about the content they've read. It has some of the skills-based questions, but it asks them to make, you know, not specifics, but very good questions about what they've read. And then ask them to make leaps to thinking about how what they've read connects to a passage they haven't seen. And do you know, it is really remarkable. It's helping the teachers stay in their curriculum. And it's actually, we don't know, I mean, COVID messed all this up, but the data looks really good. And the student comments about it when they do cognitive labs, the students say, since you won't give me the text to find the main idea, I'm just gonna tell you what I think, which is exactly what you want. I mean, so there are ways, there are ways. And, and of course the IB, IB's way of doing assessments is really good. Um, the data on the exit exams in Europe is very positive because what it does is think about this. If you're a teacher and you're giving these assessments that are about skills, it's all on you. Did you teach the skills or not? But what happens in these exit exams in Europe is, I mean, the research from, from, from those countries shows kids have to actually kind of step up to the plate. They've got to learn that teachers help them learn. And it's, the, the burden and the responsibility and the accountability is shared between it really it, it shifts so that the students are also involved in their learning process and it actually sets quite good good lessons to the field it's um there's some real really good aspects to it obviously i love education for itself not for how you do on a test but i do think there's a civil rights case to be made for assessments we have to make sure that kids are not falling behind or being underserved Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it was a good question. Okay, so the next one um, from Amit, how are the topics in the knowledge map selected? Is the quote unquote era of good feeling as a particular time period central to student knowledge that it should be addressed in a spiral of knowledge or are there particular themes that are key and that the quote unquote era is just one example? Ah, uh, okay. So good question. So the way we designed the knowledge maps, it, we started with um, the updated, I have to say updated core knowledge for students that Edie Hirsch came up with that has a lot of the top, the big domains and topics. And, and then we, we filled out the topics and the subtopics are infinite. We also had consultants from all over the kind of educational space who had different focal points. Um, both from higher ed and from the classroom and refined, calib recalibrated the things we were looking at. And then as we worked in the field and reviewed curricula, we saw, gosh, this, this is something we hadn't thought about. And so it's, it's fluid. It is fluid. The presentation that we end up, you know, the, the end result is it, it's normative in that we do think that high, there's a certain bar that any text or source should, should fit. And that's the qualitative review. It's quite robust and I'm happy to share what that's like, but it's really hard to say, oh, in fact, and we don't say these bodies of knowledge are more worthy. The way that we talk about this is, look, this is what this curriculum does. Is this okay with you? Does this meet your, if you're a district leader or a state leader or a parent, is this what, does this kind of match up with what you think the kids should be learning? And, and we can say, look, you may want to look at the fact that you, you don't even talk about um, Islam throughout the K to 12 experience, you know, that, that, that's, you know, or, or the fact that, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't, you talk about westward expansion, but you don't have a commensurate focus on, you know, um, Native Americans during this time period. You know, there, there are all kinds of nuances and things, but that's less normative 
It is more a landscape analysis of what is. So that's that's kind of our approach. That's kind of a, I'm not sure that answered your question, but that's that's uh, that's how we think about it. And I'm happy to follow up with more on that. Yeah, and I'll be sharing Ashley and Samantha's email um, after this event via email along with the bibliography. So all the works that are being cited here, you'll, you'll be able to see them. Uh, the next question comes from Bradley, who asks, how do we promote the importance of knowledge rich curricula to state departments of ed and or local school boards? And how can we challenge the resistance to knowledge rich curricula in schools of education where progressive ed ideologies are deeply embedded in the culture? Uh -huh. So the, the, they have very, those are two different things. Very, very good, very astute question here. Um, how do you go about it at the, at the state level? Um, that's, I mean, there I think telling state leaders and commissioners to talk to their membership organizations. You know, the CCSSO spend, is now supporting 13 states that are kind of making this move, not just to knowledge rich curriculum, but to high quality curriculum in general. Um, and so is cheese for change. You know, um, I think, first of all, look at some of the states that are trying to do this. Louisiana has a whole dashboard. They actually trained teachers, two teachers from every school to in the state to evaluate curricula on this really tough rubric and then to be ambassadors for it. And the state has a website of these are the top tier. And they, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good question. How do you actually make the case? There are lots of op-eds. Bradley, please write me. I'll copy you on op-eds that you can send to your state board of education and ask them the question. Why are we not serving our kids this way? There are ways to um, do curriculum audits at the district level. The resistance to it, um, it, it would take a long time to go into this. So you're welcome to look at the sources I've cited, but I would say, again, you just make the case that this is an equity. This is an equity issue. The kids who need it most are not getting it. And asking the question, what's your curriculum? What percentage of the kids are using it? You know, you would be surprised how many school systems may have adopted a curriculum, but the teachers are spending most of their time selecting their own lesson plans on Pinterest and Google and teachers pay teachers. Now, that's the vast majority of what happens. And an individual teacher may be great at this, and I don't mean to diminish that. But from the standpoint of a child in the system, if every teacher is selecting, who, there's no consistency in curriculum. It's really important that system leaders ask those questions. So if you're a parent, you can ask your school board, you can ask your principal or your superintendent, what curriculum are you endorsing? Are you supporting it? What's the hours of PD a year that's devoted to the curriculum? And, you know, and, and, and some curricula that are quite popular are not strong with knowledge building, flat out not strong. And uh, so there, there, there are th those kinds of asking those questions is really important. Now, schools of education, the, the kind of group that works on that the most is the NCTQ, the National Council for Teacher Quality. And they evaluate all the schools of ed. And one of their metrics is on, do you require subject, subject matter mastery? Fair, you're, whoever, Bradley, you're right, most do not. It's actually quite shocking. And I'm not sure how to change that. I really don't have an easy answer for how to change that. The fact is that it, it, through no fault of their own, teachers come through and get can, can get certified with very little content knowledge and the real work happens in service with the districts. And there, if you end up with a district that really has a handle on this, you're gonna learn and you'll be in good standing. If not, that's, you know, then, then, then as a teacher, you've got to do your best and you've got to develop what we would call curriculum literacy. What's the difference? What are we doing? It's very hard to, to be in that position. That's a very good question too. Okay, our next question is from um, Natalie Wexler. Uh, do you feel the bias against knowledge or the lack of content in the curriculum is more of a problem at lower grade levels? And if so, could you speak to the consequences of that at upper grade levels? 
and I would even add higher education. Oh, I think it's 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 a broken it's a broken system. I think it it pertains all the way up and all the way down. The knowledge building certainly we see fewer rich sources in primary school. We see you know in the so, in social studies we see fewer time on social studies first. I mean look you know, the, 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 it's a, it's a, there are multiple problems. There's the lack of phonemic awareness and phonics and the mechanics of learning how to read. Whole language has been, is one of the few things that has been really discredited in education research categorically, but it is still taught. And phonemic awareness is really important. Kids need to also be accessing tranches of knowledge about the world. I would say, Natalie, that's where we've certainly seen the biggest gaps. And the consequences are that kids then show up in higher upper elementary, middle school, sometimes not knowing how to read well, certainly without the background knowledge that would allow them to start engaging with these big questions of the human experience, the good life, the just society, all those things that we want to be talking about, they haven't been given the systematic access to. So the consequences are very bad for high school. I mean, it's, when, it's lack of engagement and kids dropping out. And then here's the real tragedy. The kids who are given a diploma who then go to community college and cannot take credit bearing courses. They use their Pell Grants on remediation and they drop out. There are also consequences for the teacher pipeline. If you think about it, you know, in, in Finland, you got to take exit exams that are subject matter rich to graduate from high school, to become a teacher, then you have to matriculate major in a subject and also educational research and classroom management. But here we have teachers who have not experienced a rich knowledge rich curriculum or classroom themselves and so you've got now generations you've got adult parents who don't know the questions to ask it's it's a crisis in our education that goes all the way up and all the way down starts little goes all the way up and then feeds back into that preschool classroom where they're not reading great texts now it's also a crisis for democracy it's also a crisis for democracy. So the next question is somewhat related. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but it, it goes really into the teacher preparation side of things. So do you think that in general, teachers are prepared to deliver this kind of content rich curriculum? Or maybe another way of asking the question is, what do you think the implications are for teacher prep programs? Well, you know, my bias would be for teacher prep programs to require subject matter matter expertise and also to have credentialing and curriculum literacy. I mean, Louisiana has tried to do this. I don't know where they are right now, um, but it, the ideal would be for teachers to to have classroom experience, clinical practice and subject matter expertise as part of their program. Um, the consequences, though, are for the reasons they have 100 years without content and then no help usually and in, in teacher prep programs are only in some ways is that teachers need professional development when there's a, you know, there's ample evidence that you cannot take a knowledge rich curriculum and give it to teachers and expect things to happen magically. And Tom Kane's research at Harvard shows, guess what the average amount of time that a teacher is given, the average amount of, of professional development that a teacher is given per year on a new curriculum, 1.1 day. That is not gonna cut it. You know, part of, part of the work, part of the difficulty, and, and this is long-term fruit, is not just adopting a high quality curriculum, in your school or your system, but making sure teachers have this, have the practice, have the support, usually from the curriculum providers themselves. Actually, we wrote a memo on this that's in the bibliography about designing a, an RFP that includes professional development. This is really, really important. I mean, I'm so glad that you asked that question because teachers are the critical, teacher is the critical piece here and they need every bit of support we can give them. Most professional development is about things that are not relevant to the classroom instruction, you know. 
It's not, it, it, we can change this. Again, this is being changed in courageous districts and systems, private schools, charter schools, district schools. It takes a lot. So the next, um, I'm gonna kind of combine two questions that are related to higher ed. So one is, um, as students progress towards college, if that's their desired route, do you see any value in shifting towards skill sets to help them thrive in college and start exploring a career path also infused in content discovery? And with that, someone was wondering if there's data on college admission success with content rich versus skills based high school curriculum. Um, and we can have this be our, our last question. Okay. All right. Well, this is a great, this is, this is great. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, I'll have to think about an exact research study that that shows the difference, but I can tell you that um, there, there are two things, the kinds of the kinds of content that kids need to know when they go off to college should be back mapped from the freshman year of what a kid needs to know to thrive intellectually at a high powered school. I mean, this is when Massachusetts, the Massachusetts miracle that happened in the 90s, when Massachusetts redesigned its school system, um, it was it was controversial, but they started with what a 12th grade graduate needed to know going off to college. And then they back mapped it grade by grade by grade by grade. And then they tied teacher certification to it. And then they tied professional development to it. Now that catapulted Massachusetts to the top of the charts in our country. So being very intentional about back mapping, but, but there's more in the questions that's about the skills that are needed and the social capital building skills are really important too. And uh, I'm just going to go back to that earlier example that I, I, I had about, about the IB program in Chicago. The kids that were from very, you know, first generation, low income families and schools that had not been doing well. Those kids who went through the program, the IB program, 40% greater chance of going to school, high college and completing college, 50% greater chance of going to selective colleges. What the IB program found is that those kids were intellectually prepared, but they did not have the confidence to go talk to their, their professors, to get help when they needed it, to navigate some of the systems that they needed to. So they started building that in. They actually created a whole sort of, for want of a better term, social capital building um, process in the summer times to help kids make that handoff. And KIPP through college does the same thing. I mean, this is not just about intellectual formation. It's about the kind of social capital building skills that kids need alongside of those. And again, I want nothing against skills. Those skills are important. They just need to be done in content and in, in tandem with the content. There's also something else implied in one of those questions that I want to address. And that is about kids who are not going to college. And this is where I find the model that they have in Germany and Switzerland quite persuasive that there is a the same curriculum, the same assessments all the way up to age 14, 15, or 16. My preference would probably be 16. And so every child has, an, has access to that content rich curriculum after which they can say, I mean, they can all, they are all at the high level. So no one is pre selecting what they can and cannot do. No one is closing doors to them. And then at that point, they can explore a vocational track that is still very industry ready and um, compensates very highly or go to university. Switzerland, only 30% of, of the graduates go to university because most are going into jobs that they wanna go into and they're being prepared for that. So, you know, there's some downsides to that, but I think it's most persuasive. Very few states really have great career and technical education programs. Delaware Pathways, if you're interested in this, Delaware Pathways is the best, probably one of the best in the country. It's certainly the best one I've seen. There are ways to do that, but I, I, I am so concerned about however excited I get about career and technical, I'm so concerned about sacrificing the knowledge that every child should have. And again, not 
I'm not working for the IB here, but IB does have a career pathways program that Rahm Emanuel and the, the current administration has put in all a lot of their major high schools. And I've been in those classrooms and they are college preparatory and also very career focused. Thank you I so think, much. Yeah, I think that's a perfect place to end it is five o'clock Eastern on the dot. So we won't take up too much more of folks time, but Ashley, thank you so, so much for sharing your time and energy and insights with us. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who, who tuned in this afternoon. And like I said, we'll be in touch with uh, more information via email, but thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Yep, thanks everyone. Take thanks care. Ashley.